Joining me today over a coffee, virtually, is the European Commissioner for Transport, Adina Volan. We talk about the digitalization of the transport sector, the impact of COVID, and will she be the Commissioner who saves Christmas? Commissioner, thanks for joining us over a coffee this morning. Uh, unusual circumstances, and I hope in a couple of months we can do this in a cafe somewhere. But uh, let's uh, talk about the resilience of the transport sector. You know, this has been a, a real shock to the system, but there's the possibility that with digitalization, the use of data, in the future, the transport sector could be more efficient and uh, uh, more carbon friendly as well. We have seen the shocks in the transport sector brought by the pandemic, you might cry if you read the numbers, because it goes directly to our way of life in Europe, benefiting on the transport. And the fact that now everything is near a standstill because of the second wave of the corona and we, with all the problems during the summer, this brings uh, up the resilience of the system and what kind of a sector are we going to have after these uh, waves of, um, of crisis. But has the crisis accelerated? the process by which the transport sector will uh, take on uh, uh, digitalization and, and use data more efficiently. You still have elements of trust, uh, which have to be negotiated as well, and then the harmonization of the data systems across Europe. You see these as obstacles, or are we still in opportunity mode? The problem is the scale of the needs, in my opinion, because if you look at each mode in the transport sector, you would need investments and digitalization in order to make it um, uh, more modern to give more possibilities and the uh, business opportunities for the sector but also more opportunities and sustainability to the passengers and the citizens using this uh, transport mode. Where do you think the, the biggest wins, the, the quickest wins are to be had? In urban environments or, or in freight transport for example? Where, where should the focus of the activity uh, be at the moment in terms of c connected cities, smart mobility? Well, for uh, smart cities, I think uh, this is an easy gain. But by the other hand, this is something which will develop uh, on a business case because we have seen that smart solutions inside cities are developing without uh, the need of uh, the politician to say, oh, so you have now to start developing these solutions. No, it's, it's, it becomes a business case because more and more our citizens in our cities are uh, embracing this kind, uh, this new way of uh, moving around, more sustainable. They like uh, to, to be informed. We, we have seen the digitalization uh, of the services inside cities to pick up uh, very well. So I think more the focus for us, for the politician, for, uh, for myself, through my, the strategy I'm going to pro, uh, propose before the end of the year is try to reach gains in bigger projects, which would mean, for example, for the multimodality, we need terminals, we need digitalization, share of data, and this for this, we have to create a framework in which, as you were mentioning at the beginning of our conversation, trust won't be a problem in sharing information. And then we see the, the Green Lanes uh, recommendations, uh, communication you've just announced as well. You know, the, the trust element is there, not just uh, between uh, the operators, but between member states as well. And COVID has challenged uh, that as well. The Green Lanes, what's different about this package? The Green Lanes is a great achievement in COVID. And it worked very well, and it's working very well. So first, let's not forget that uh, you have to pass through a border point in 15 minutes. This is the most important. Secondly, and we can go back to digitalization. I think our aim is to have all the papers digitalized if possible, uh, so that uh, the transport workers won't have to interact uh, through paper with a burger door control or something. This is for their safety and also for the smooth op of the operation, smoothening the operation. What is new is that we are trying to include also rail and inland waterways in the same principle of green lanes. We are also uh, asking for allowing uh, transit corridors inside the country. Also for uh, personal cars, for personal travelers. So if you have to go across a country, then you should be uh, accepted as a transit uh, person and then not uh, be subjected to quarantine or testing or obligation or so on and so forth. But there are two things which are we, we are announcing. Uh, they are not ready yet, 
but uh, uh, they have the potential of a game changer for tra um, international travel. One is the testing protocols. We need to have an harmonized, accepted across Europe testing protocol. When we're looking at this, what's the timeline for this? You know, how aligned are the member states in this? You know, is, is Council ready to accept this proposal? I'm moderate optimistic that uh, this has to come uh, quick because uh, everyone is asking for this harmonized approach. And I was mentioning a second one, uh, which is the passenger locator form. Uh, it will be easier than for people to travel if they have clarity on what is required from them. How long do you think it will take uh, to get this approved uh, at council level? Before Christmas, because I'm absolutely sure people would like to travel to see family uh, for Christmas and uh, we have to save the Christmas, yeah? Somehow. <laughs> the Commissioner will save Christmas. This, this could be uh, your legacy. Let's talk about the Western Balkans as well. You just completed the Third Ministerial Council on this. Uh, so transport is not just in Europe, it's, it's global, but also we're looking at how we develop uh, our neighborhood and the, the Western Balkans uh, economy as well. What was the outcome of the Western Balkans in terms of transport? The development of the infrastructure in transport is seen by countries in the Western Balkans. And I recall very vividly, because I'm coming from a country which uh, had a, a late accession to the European Union, and I know how important it was for us, or it is still in Romania, to develop the infrastructure as a way for the economic development of the country. And on uh, Red 2, what, what's being discussed at Red 2? Are we just going to be looking at modifications to targets, or is there going to be some substantial change uh, in, in, in discussion? Of course, we are very much committed to the European Green Deal. In terms of renewables, of course, we are committed in transport to have uh, to deploy recharging and refueling stations. Uh, we are saying at least one million um, in the next years um, because, of course, uh, infrastructures need to be here. Infrastructure need to be here in order to incentivize the deployment, the buying of uh, electrical cars. What role do low carbon fuels play in this uh, energy transition before we get uh, to the fully renewable stage? Because of the technological specificities in uh, transport modes, of course, uh, while, uh, for example, in rail, you uh, can have electricity uh, electrified, uh, then you might have hydrogen. It is, um, anyway, rail, for example, it's very sustainable. Uh, then um, for aviation, for aviation, I'm looking at uh, e-fuels, why not? We have biofuels, but then this has to be sustainable. We are looking in the future for hydrogen. Um, electrical, it's more difficult now, it's just uh, announced for, um, I think EASA just certified one, uh, which is a small one of two places. So for small one it works, or for a uh, small uh, range, but uh, not for bigger ones. So we are looking at hydrogen, then we are looking in road, uh, I think uh, for um, uh, heavy duty vehicles, still the LNG remains an option for quick gain. Uh, if we want to have a quick reduction, uh, then of course in the long run, uh, hydrogen, uh, electrical, why not? In terms of aviation fuels, uh, what's the structure going to be? Is it going to be a mandate for a, a new uh, regulation of aviation fuels or uh, will it be something which continues as is because of what's happened to the airline sector at the moment that no additional pressure should be applied? Uh, first and foremost, as I said, there is a basket of measures. So uh, more sustainable aircraft. And we can see already that some, uh, because of the reduced capacity, some are already uh, retiring some of the old aircrafts. I'm not saying it's compulsory. Of course, it is uh, something we have to look for the future to support or to encourage the sector to um, put in use the most um, uh, new ones because these are more sustainable, more efficient. Um, then um, for the fuels, uh, we can think at a, a blending mandate, why not? Uh, but uh, for example, we have to s make sure that there is enough there on the market uh, in terms of alternative fuels for aviation for them to be able to benefit from it. So in parallel, we have to find the right way to develop the market for alternative fuels for aviation in order to provide enough volumes for them to make the step in uh, replacing or blending um, for the moment with uh, new alternative fuels. On maritime, what's the strategy with Maritime uh, as well? Is it something similar to, to the airline or do you have a substantially different approach to how you're dealing with the Maritime strategy? 
We have uh, substantially the same ambition. <laughs> so we have ambition, but the approach, uh, let's see about that, because uh, maritime is uh, by nature very global. So um, we don't want to move the problem from uh, here to there. We want to solve the problem of more sustainable maritime. We are asked to imagine or to include maritime into an uh, European ETS. Ideally, it would be that um, we would have an agreement at uh, global level, because or else mm, I'm not sure if the gains would be that substantial. Finally, on trains as well, the, the Consumer Association Bureau, they said that you missed the, an opportunity when dealing with uh, consumer rights on rail transport. Uh, you think that's the case? I think everyone was very pleased with our proposal of the Commission. But it's not up to us to decide in the end. So it was a process in which the co-legislators, the Parliament, European Parliament and the Council decided on what they wish to agree. And of course, maybe it's not um, the most ambitious one, but I think it, it's important to be a solid one so that uh, we'll have protection in this respect. So, of course, it's easy to uh, point out at the Commission, but I think we did our job in proposing a solid... Uh, uh, a solid uh, legislative uh, act and uh, then it's up to them to decide in the end and let's see how it works. Just to finish, your optimism uh, for the future of the transport sector post-COVID, what, what, uh, what do you think can be achieved during the mandate of, of this commission? What do you think the big change will be at the end of, of your term here? What I would aim to see in four years from now, it would be that we have built in the sector, the resilience needed for uh, possible shocks and crises. I would like to see um, in place uh, deployed uh, or um, uh, the alternative uh, infra fuels infrastructure to incentivize the deployment of new vehicles. And something I would love to see is uh, a new focus on intermodality. If I will see couple of new terminals for uh, multimodality for freight transport in Europe, I would be very happy because uh, I think uh, this is the future of uh, being uh, smart and sustainable. If you can make the best use of all the modes to move uh, into the logistic and to move goods across Europe. Commissioner, thanks for joining us over a coffee today. Thank you very much for inviting me.